flight medic. He entered the pre-hospital world in 94 as an EMT in Alfreda Fire Department. After moving to Phoenix, um, he graduated from a paramedic school in April of 97. He worked at Southwest Ambulance over the East Valley um, and here in Mount Graham until 2000. Late last summer, in 90, or late summer of 99, he began medicine, uh, flight medicine uh, for a jet. And um, in 2000, he began working for the San Carlos EMT, um, continuing uh, to fly fixed wing. In 2001, he started flying full time for LifeNet. Along the way, Gary worked for Mount Brown in the emergency department, Greene County um, EMS Morency and Duncan. Um, he's also an EMS educator and has taught uh, basic life support, advanced cardiac life support, and pediatric um, advanced life support. So let's give a warm welcome for Gary Garcia. Septic uh, SIRS, which is uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Uh, that's caused by either sepsis, burns, trauma, uh, pancreatitis. The next one I'll talk about is, is uh, neurogenic shock, also, uh, also been called uh, spinal, uh, spinal shock or spinal trauma, or usually caused by spinal trauma. And then, and then I'll talk about uh, anaphylaxis. Uh, and anaphylactic shock is, is, you know, and kind of give you the difference between an allergic reaction and an anaphylactic shock. Septic shock is, is a, a serious condition that, that occurs when an overwhelming uh, infection leads to life threatening low blood pressure. Uh, know that infections can, uh, can occur anywhere in the body. Uh, urinary tract infection is the most common with sepsis. Uh, but it, again, it can happen anywhere and just kind of send, send uh, your patient into septic shock. Uh, occurs most often very young, very old, um, or patients who have other illnesses, like you have more than just one thing, one uh, 
when all this is going on, when it's basically when your, your immune system is at its lowest point. Cause are many, many types of bacteria, uh, including gram negative and gram positive bacteria, and also uh, fungi. But the body uh, produces a strong inflammatory response. Toxins and inflammation may contribute to the, to the organ damage. And that's, that's the combination we're going to talk about here in just a minute uh, when it comes to sepsis. Uh, sepsis is probably the lead, or one of the leading causes of shock being run on besides hypovolemia. Uh, it's estimated, sepsis is estimated in 300 to 500,000 patients annually in the U.S. And, uh, the estimated mortality rate for a septic shock is about 45%. Uh, and obviously that, that mortality rate depends on <coughs> patient's age, their health condition, uh, or overall health, uh, the cause of the infection, what, you know, why they got sick in the first place, and, and uh, how many organs have failed. And then also, it, it also depends on how fast we how fast we get the treatment started, and how aggressive we are with that treatment. So what happens in sepsis? What happens is an immune, uh, immune and inflammatory response begins to combat the organism causing the infection. So our body, uh, what's our body's defense mechanism for infection? Sorry? That's a, a symptom we have with it. With it. We, uh, what, our, what our body does is, is creates, creates a lot of white blood cells, right? To fight that infection. So that's an inflammatory response that, uh, that begins. Um, body releases multiple chemicals in the bloodstream, including uh, uh, white blood cells. Uh, Cytokines, vasodilators, uh, and, and other organic or other chemicals. The body itself also releases uh, substances called endotoxins and exotoxins, or exotoxins, which uh, further harm the body of the tissue, the organ of the tissue. The septic shock, and it just so says, Septic shock is a response. Uh, in shock is a response to inadequate elimination infection of the infection and actually causes uh, increased damage. The combination of, of the, the chemicals and, and toxins cause two different things. One causes peripheral vasodilation, peripheral vasodilation uh, which causes decreased blood flow or blood return, excuse me, blood return to the heart and, uh, and also causes interstitial edema. And two, uh, it decreases the ability of the cells and tissues uh, to take oxygen and glucose. Uh, because that's what our cells live on is oxygen and uh, glucose, right? That's what a cell needs to live. Well, with the vasodilation, uh, and the inability to get it, get it to the cell, that's when the cells start dying off in the organs as well. Some risk factors, shock. You got diabetes, uh, disease of, of the intestinal, biliary, and, and genital urinary systems, uh, diseases that weaken the immune system, that's like AIDS. Uh, or HIV, uh, and dwelling catheters, that's a pretty big one. Uh, you see a, a lot of uh, elderly populations who have dwelling catheters, especially when they change them out of home, they don't really clean themselves very good, end up in the, end up in the ER with the, with the UTI. Long-term uh, antibiotic use, uh, leukemia or lymphoma, 
key there is they're already immunosuppressed, and so they're more susceptible to sepsis and septic shock. Any recent infection, recent surgery, medical procedure they've had done, and if uh, any recent steroid medication they're, that they're using, uh, like corticosteroids, with because of that, does will lower, lower the immune system as well. Any questions so far? <coughs> what we look for, what we look for in septic uh, shock, and how we're going to treat, is also going to determine how we treat the patient. The patient they present with uh, full, uh, palpable extremities. Their temperature may be, may be very high, very low. Usually we uh, uh, look for se uh, sepsis, uh, look for a temperature that's lower than 96.4 or anything greater than 100.4. We'll, we'll define as sepsis. Patients may be lightheaded. Uh, they're going to have low, low blood pressure, especially while standing. And that, that's one of the key things, is, too, is if you have a patient that's laying in bed uh, and their blood pressure is so-so, stand them up, see if they're orthostatic. If they're, blood, they're orthostatic, their blood pressure will drop. So you get lightheaded and dizzy. Um, the heart rate will, will increase as well. Uh, they may they already may complain of uh, palpitations or, or rapid heart rate. Uh, they, they might be maybe uh, lethargic or confused on this side of that. They might also be uh, restless or agitated. Um, they will also uh, shortness of breath. Uh, they have a lower absent urine output. And so with these patients, it's really, especially if you're getting a lot of fluid, um, it's really important to uh, to monitor their eyes and nose because you don't want to send somebody in the pulmonary edema and where they basically the lungs fill up and they drown. Uh, basically, you want to make sure whatever you're putting in, you're also getting out. Um, and also have a irrational and discoloration of the skin. Uh, when it comes to the heart rate, the blood pressure starts to increase the workload on the heart. Uh, the heart tries harder and harder to get oxygen and glucose to those cells. And so, and it does that by increasing heart rate and contractility. And that's why you'll see the, uh, the implanted palpitations and you'll see the rapid heart rate. The uh, so, uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine and the European Society of Critical Care Medicine got together and they came up with this uh, surviving sepsis. And, uh, and it's basically what you want, the, the algorithm you want to follow to whenever you have a septic patient or a septic shock patient. And you want, you want to maximize O2 delivery and minimize O2 demand. And the way you do that is you want to put them on a non-rebreather, as long as you're you know, uh, conscious enough for it, put them on a non-rebreather uh, mask with high flow to like 15 liters a minute. A minute. You want to stabilize the hemodynamics, keep their MAP uh, at about uh, greater than 65. It's really important to have the, the for the doctor put a, a CDP line in, and you want to monitor your head, make sure if they're not innovated, you want to keep the CDP between 8 and 12, and, uh, or if they're innovated, 12 and 15. And then you want to make sure that, again, watch their out, urine output, and hopefully they have a better than uh, 0.5 milliliters an hour. Now, in order to achieve this, as far as stabilizing, stabilizing the dynamics, fluid resuscitation. Uh, is key. That's the first thing you want to do. You want to start off on a, on a normal adult patient with 30 milligram or 30 milliliters, excuse me, 30 milliliters per kilogram of uh, normal saline or lactate ringers IV, and that may that can be repeated 
to get the blood pressure you, you, that you're looking for, and uh, and also to keep that uh, CDP up to between 8 and 12 or 12 and 15 if you're integrated, like I said. And uh, but whenever you whenever you're giving fluids, you want to be cognizant of also patients' uh, lung sounds. You don't make sure you're not they're not getting your lung sounds aren't getting wet and so on and so forth. Next thing you want to consider is consider pharmacological uh, intervention. Now up here it says you can use dopamine or lymphed. I will tell you more doctors now that we've seen uh, when we uh, have patients with sepsis is they'll go straight to lymphed. And uh, you want to start initiating your leave bed infusion at uh, 0.5 to 1 mics per minute and then titrate up to desired response. Uh, maintenance infusion is usually between uh, 2 and 20 mics a minute. Uh, usual dose that we, we see patients when they, we get the blood pressure that they, they desire is that we're looking for is that we on roughly 2 to 4 mics a minute. As far as dopamine is concerned, uh, start, you can start off a uh, patient at five mics per, kilo, per kilogram per minute and then titrate that. If, uh, if, if blood pressure is not responsive to leave fed, you want to switch over to uh, vasopressin. Uh, and if the vasopressin is not working, you want to go to corticosteroid, and that's uh, uh, hydrocortisone as an example. If your patient is on insulin, you want to closely, uh, insulin drip, you want to closely monitor uh, their blood glucose. For, and why, what we will do is, uh, in our pro, uh, patient care guidelines, we check the blood sugar every 30 minutes if they're on insulin drip. Like I said, I have a little like, app on my phone that does everything for me, so I, I've got to be busy. <laughs> um, and CVP, there's a whole different uh, one for that. And again, I have an uh, app on my phone that does that for me, too. So I'm sorry I couldn't do that. <laughs> um, 
And, and you know that normal CDP is between 8 and 12. You know, uh, yes, there will be a similar literature where it says, you know, 10 or below. Um, moving along, uh, no genetic shock. That's lost sympathetic tone and resulting in massive dilation. You, you, judging by that, uh, judging by that uh, x-ray, do you think they have a problem with your neurogenic shock? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if they're alive, wow. You, you, you go, boy. <laughs> or girl, whichever. Uh, anyway, neurogenic shock. Uh, a lot of, uh, like I said before, it's also known as spinal shock. Uh, usually a result of a traumatic injury involving the neck and spine. Unfortunately, in my career, what I've seen with neurogenic shock is a proverbial 17, 18, 19 year old guy that has had a few too many and he jumped off a cliff into water and didn't realize the water was only about a foot deep. And he smacked his head, broke his neck, and we responded. We went home to we responded, and uh, I watched one. I watched him sober up like it was no tomorrow. Two, um, he unfortunately he didn't have any feelings from the neck down, and but I watched his blood pressures, and I, I just kind of watched him go into this this, this uh, neurogenic shock. And we got on him really quick. We got on him with, this, with the fluids and we got him and everything. And actually, about a year later, working in the ER, one of the ambulances brought, brought this same patient in. And uh, the, the medic told me, he goes, Man, I'm really sorry. This, I brought you this. This guy's kind of a handful of train wreck. And I said, No, you don't understand. This guy I picked up a year ago he wasn't moving anything and he's moving his legs now. That's awesome. Means hopefully, I mean, on one hand, I was, I, maybe I helped make a difference. Or my, the, 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 crew, the team I was with helped make a difference, and that's not some failure. So, what happens in neurogenic shock? On, uh, like I said, it's massive widespread vasodilation because of an insult to the spinal column. Um, on the arterial side, you, you get uh, decreased peripheral vascular resistance. On the venous side, you get uh, decreased venous return because of that vasodilation, right? Uh, which decreases the stroke volume, which also reduces uh, cardiac uh, cardiac output, and thus uh, decreasing tissue perfusion. perfusion. Signs and symptoms. <coughs> Um, pain and tenderness. You, know, you, you think, and, and then you also see the paralysis there, you think, if they're paralyzed, how do they, how do they feel? What I'm, what, where the pain and tenderness comes from is the point of the injury, where like they have neck pain and you can feel it back there. They may or may not have deformity in the neck. Uh, and, and sometimes we can, or sometimes we, or most of them can't palpate it, uh, unless it's a rhetorical obvious Dice or uh, insult like that one. X-ray, you just saw. It may see some soft tissue injury. Uh, obviously, paralysis below the uh, insult point. You're gonna see low blood pressure. They'll be bradycardic uh, because they don't have that that drive anymore. As far as uh, respiration, there may be diaphragmatic respirations or shallow. Not there's not a lot of air movement. To see a loss of uh, bowel or bladder control, they're going to complain of difficulty breathing, and then, then they, uh, for guys like that, um, you know, what we're going to what we're going to do to these people? If, We're going to manage ABCs, man, assess and manage ABCs. What I mean by ABCs is airway breathing circulation. We monitor the airway closely because these are the kind of people they, you know, they, 
they've already lost the best their tone, or they've already lost it, they become paralyzed from the insult down. So you don't really, you know, what's, who's to say that you won't lose their airway shortly after that? Um, so you want to be aggressive in managing their airway and, uh, and, and make sure they stay breathing. You want to and in, in the field, what we would do is we we would immobilize them on the backboard. Um, I know that I know we're here in the ER. If they if a patient shows up in a, in a personal vehicle, they send them to the hospital, and they're presenting these kinds of, these kinds of uh, signs and symptoms. We're going to put them on a backboard there too as well. So uh, and then take X-rays and go and go from there. You want to treat the blood pressure. Uh, treat blood pressure with fluids, lots and lots of fluids. Um, again, 30 milliliters per kilogram. So, you know, basically to give you an idea of how much that is in a 90 kilogram patient, you're going to give, you're going to give about 2,700 cc's of fluid in one bolus. So that's a little over two and a half liters of fluid. Um, and then if their lungs can handle it and they're improving with it, give them another one. Uh, if the patient's, if the patient's uh, blood pressure is not responding to fluids, that's when you want to consider dopamine or leave that. Uh, Basically, it's like you know where the tank was full before. You get, you get the insult to the, uh, insult the body, and you vasodilate. Well, all of a sudden, uh, that tank's not full anymore. And same kind of same prayer too. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I have a it's okay. I'm I'm, I'm no block. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm three block. How's that? <laughs> That, that, that's a very good question. Dopamine and Ludafed, what, what do they do? Gary, can you repeat the question? Because I don't know over here, we didn't hear what the question was. Okay, over oh, here, the question was what, uh, what does Ludafed and dopamine do? Dopamine is, is an ionotropic agent that what it does is it causes uh, vasoconstriction. So, what you're trying to do is take those, those veins that are vasodilated out. Squeeze them, and basically we have the same thing. Kind of a different drug. Yes. Some of us don't know what anotropic is. That word. Anotropic. It increases the contact in the heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bonus points. <laughs> yeah, it increases the contact in the heart. Uh, but yeah, and what you're gonna see with dopamine is, uh, you hopefully you'll see what you'll see is. Uh, the blood pressure goes up because they're basal constricting, and you're also going to see their heart rate go up because it has those properties as well. Um, and then uh, leave the basically the same thing. It, it, it uh, I can't remember what, what class it's from, but what the basal constricts. I'm sorry? Yeah, nor it, it, uh, it basal constricts. And uh, to help get that blood pressure. Now, if the patient continues to have significant hypotension, what I mean by significant hypotension is a blood pressure, uh, systolic blood pressure, excuse me, of less than 90, uh, and after you've administered four liters of fluid, uh, you want to consider a phenol effort drug. Phenylephrine. Phenylephrine. Uh, 
It's, 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 it's another, like, what has proper the basal of the script. Okay, and it's, it's all, it's all due to, you know, get the, to reverse that basal dilation. Yes. Yeah, it's just a different approach. After the 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 dopamine relief effect. Yeah. Um, and these patients need to be transported to a level one trauma center uh, because one level one trauma center is what it's all about the uh, facility and, and the facility what, what uh, services they they give. Um, they have, you know, this patient needs a neurologist. Can you help define what is the difference between like a level one and level two trauma centers? What would be defining characteristics? Yeah, I can, I can try. Level one trauma center, uh, you'll hear this uh, as far as levels of trauma centers. Level one trauma center is the highest level. They, they basically take anything they have. Uh, 24 hour day, seven day week, uh, trauma surgery available, uh, along with uh, uh, neurosurgery um, and uh, general surgery, uh, gastrointestinal surgery, basically anything that would, would uh, they would need to put the patient back together. Level two. Uh, I think, I, actually, I think the state's kind of gotten away from level two and three and four. Level two used to be, uh, you can take a patient there, if, if, no, I'm sorry, level one is also, you know, take a patient there that meets that level one criteria as far as uh, there was a death, in, a death in the same vehicle, they were ejected out of a car during the accident, uh, they would fall greater, greater than 20 feet, um, Blood pressure is really, really low. Uh, you know, uh, evidence of traumatic brain injuries and stuff like that. Um, and and it, you know, these people are very, very sick from that uh, from that uh, insult that they had. So you want to take them to, to a level one trauma center. Level two is they'll take patients that have the mechanism for those same injuries. But they just don't have those injuries. Is what, if that makes any sense. Any questions? Any more questions on neurogenic? So. Oh, the other thing was uh, on neurogenic shock. Uh, after a treat blood pressure, uh, check, check, check and treat temperatures. These patients have lost the ability to regulate their body temperature. So you want to keep them as close to what normal as you can. Anaphylactic shock, and that, that's what is that is a severe anaphylactic re reaction. Um, Anaphylactic shock is a, is a result of an immediate hypersensitive reaction caused by uh, uh, antibody antigen response. These are, uh, this is a true life threatening emergency. It's also one that we can correct really, really quick. And what happens is, is a patient has an exposure to an antigen, you know, like a bee sting or peanuts or something like that. Uh, what happens is that uh, the exposure happens, the activation of uh, sensitized antibodies. You have the antigen antibody reaction, and then in the body will release uh, release vasoactive mediators like histamine, heparin, uh, cytokines, resulting in uh, massive vasodilation. Uh, causing increased uh, capillary permeability, 
So they might have a little bit of swelling and that the hives come from, uh, resulting in interstitial edema and relative hypovolemia. The signs of symptoms the skin, uh, you know, from a normal allergic reaction, you'll see the, the, the hives, and the swelling and itching, um, with septic, or the, I'm sorry, with anaphylactic shock, you're gonna look really flush, and they're gonna, and they, they're or even cyanotic. Rest of the line of difficulty breathing, maybe coughing or wheezing, uh, sneezing, they may have a strider. Uh, that strider and the wheezing is due to laryngeal edema, laryngeal, laryngeal spasm, and bronchospasm. Cardiovascular wise, you see an increase in heart rate, vasodilation. Uh, you all, and because of vasodilation, you see a lower blood pressure. Uh, patient may complain of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, have some abdominal cramping. Nervous system, you'll have a headache, headache or dizziness, lightheadedness. The, the biggest difference between uh, Anaphylactic shock and allergic reaction is an allergic reaction kind of comes on gradually. And uh, anaphylactic shock is comes on real quick and has an onset of about 30 to 60 seconds. So does that kind of um, determine whether it's having another reaction how fast it's going to be? The question is, is uh, does that determine? How, how fast it is an allergic reaction or? Or whether it's an allergic reaction and fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that, that's, that's determination whether it's anaphylaxis, uh, anaphylaxis shock or just an allergic reaction. Um, and I don't, want to, I don't want to sound like, you know, just an allergic reaction because an allergic reaction can lead to an anaphylactic shock depending on the person. Common, uh, Antigens, uh, you know, food, people have allergies in milk, eggs, uh, fish, shellfish, shellfish, sorry, uh, strawberry, citrus, and chocolate. Uh, diagnostic agents, you know, people, you know, in, in, in nursing, people say, I'm allergic to the dye, in contrast dye for the CTs. Um, Biologic agents, uh, blood, blood pumps, <coughs> insulin, vaccines. Environmental uh, uh, patients, uh, people, you know, pollens are in the air, molds, uh, animal hair. When it comes to drugs or pharmaceuticals, you know, you have people, I'm allergic to penicillin, I'm allergic to morphine, I'm allergic to whatever. Their, their allergy is. And then uh, there's like bees and snakes, spiders, fire ants, stuff like that. Now management of anaphylaxis. Oops. Management of anaphylaxis, we're gonna aggressively assess and manage the ABCs. You, want, you really, really want to protect the airway. Uh, airway will close off due, due, due to the uh, swelling and edema. Uh, you want to provide high flow, high flow oxygen, uh, the amount of breather. If your patient is hypoventilating or apneic, you want to uh, initiate ventilatory assistance, meaning you're going you to get, get your uh, bag valve mask out and uh, and start and start to uh, breathe for them. I have heard that patients are moving away from using the OPAs, the enteric, mm -hmm. the OPAs rather um, and using the backs because it's a much longer faster. I I have heard that the question is is uh, is EMT is moving away from uh, OP, using OPAs when they use a bag valve mask uh, to ventilate patients. I have not personally heard that. Um, in my response to that, I would say if, if a patient's sized right on an OPA, uh, there's less trauma. I've heard it, but we have not gone away from using them. Yeah. It's just a so far. Yeah. 
You hear a lot of rumors in yeah, medicine. Especially in medicine, you hear lots of rumors. Yeah, you hear lots of medicine, rumors in medicine. And really, honestly, for your guys' script, get in writing. <laughs> really? Using an OPA, using, not using it, just using a bag, that is, in my opinion, that's detrimental. Because yeah. what the OPA does is it keeps you from closing off the airway with the relaxation of the tongue. If you don't do that and you're trying to bag something, even if you lift the chin, you can still get some mm -hmm. secondary relaxation of that tongue that blocks your airway. The OPA simply lifts that up out of the way, keeps the airway open so when you're ventilating. So uh, to me, that sounds crazy, but I'm an old school guy too. Yeah. So. Yes. Last I heard, they just changed the way you insert it. You used to insert it upside down and rotate it. But they said that caused damage, so now they just put them right in. Um, That's the only change I've heard. Okay. Well, and actually, that, that the, what the question or statement, I guess, was, was the, they had heard they changed the way that we insert the OPAs. Um, I think it all depends on who teaches you, on, honestly. I, I know for myself, I, don't, I can't speak for right now, for myself, I'll teach you to turn it upside down and rotate it. Because that that's an easy, it's just a really easy way to get behind the tongue. If you go just put it in straight in, you run the risk of pushing the tongue back See, and blocking off the airway. We, we've always taught that for like pediatrics and stuff because they have very soft palates and it's very easy to, but you always have to be careful you know, when you put it straight in, especially with pediatrics because they have very big and gorged tongues. So you're gonna push that tongue back. Same thing with an adult. It's very easy to push that tongue back and block the airway, but if you're dropping an OPA and not paying attention, you can push that tongue back Think that the OPA, the OPA is sitting right, and it's not, and you're not going to ventilate. So, uh, like I said, I'm like, I'm like Gary, I'm very old school. Like, something works, why change it? I never had a problem with that. So, I'd have to see literature or uh, explanations to why we don't rotate them in adults anymore. I, I don't know. That's and, and that's why I say get it really in writing. Yeah. You know, you know and they say, well, let's be careful with the grapevine. Well, we, we change our way of doing this. We're going to do it this way instead. And you hear that from coworkers or your managers or whatever, and then all of a sudden, you know, in a couple months, they're like, why are you doing that? Way? Who told you that? Well, Sally over here told me we're doing it this way. Like, oh, well, she told you it's wrong. And you'll find the longer you're medicine, you can get five providers in one room and have five different opinions on how to do something. Oh, yeah. You can never get and you never answer, to Yeah, you, you never get a straight answer. That's, oh, that's you know, we're practicing medicine, right? <laughs> Patients on me. Well, don't practice on me to get it right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. Man manage it that way. If you can, if you can manage your way to be LS wise, and connect with let's see, either just oxygen or using a bad valve mask with an LPA, great. If you can get an LPA in, that means they don't have a gag reflex anymore. And maybe they didn't have one in the beginning. Who knows? But I know all school general rule of thumb was that they, if they accepted an LPA, we're innovating. Because that means they lost their gag, and the potential for them to lose their airway increased right there. Uh, medications, you want to consider epinephrine as a primary drug. It used to be we, we gave uh, epinephrine. It was, uh, the dose of epi was epi in one to one thousand concentration was 0.3 to 0.5 sub Q. They changed that to uh, 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams uh, IM because they found uh, going IM as, as opposed to sub Q, it worked faster. Uh, and also the, the, those epi pins, in, 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 you guys want those epi pins look like? Look like? Whenever, you, whenever a patient uses them, I don't know if you've ever seen one been discharged or not, they're long needles, <laughs> really long needles. And whenever they, when a patient uses them, they go right there in the thigh, and that's, that's probably the best place to go, and that's the, the, the patient picks up, uh, will pick it up faster. Uh, you go in the thigh, and it's, it's a deep IM in, injection. Uh, other other uh, medications to consider. If you have a mild reaction, you want to obviously start off the epi, and you want to start off with one to one thousand concentration. If you have a severe reaction, 
uh, you might want to consider stepping it up a little bit with the epi and going to one, one to 10,000 concentration. And that dose is uh, 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams over five minutes, and but that's also IV. Um, and, it, and you only want to do that, that dose right there if the patient is experiencing severe life threatening reaction or shows signs of shock. And signs of shock are the hypervolemia, about the heart rate. Um, to, for the, for the uh, fluid bolus, I'm sorry, other than this, consider if you're wheezing, you want to consider you giving a butyrol. Uh, 2.5 milligrams and 3 cc's of uh, good uh, nebulized or you know, the, the nebul uh, small volume nebulizer. Uh, you want to consider giving uh, Benadryl 25 to 50 milligrams IV or I deep IM every six hours. And then give them a dose of cellulose 125 milligrams. Um, and then for adults, you want to give renin or Zantac, is the name for it. And, uh, and you're probably thinking, if you, who all knows what Zantac is? Uh, H2 blocker. Yeah, so you're gonna block that histamine. H, uh, with uh, Epi or Benadryl, you're blocking H1, and uh, Zantac is blocking H2. Uh, for the hypotension, uh, give uh, 250 cc bolus of fluid. Uh, repeat as necessary as long as the patient does not show signs of uh, volume overload. Uh, if uh, hypotension doesn't respond to your fluids, you might want to consider starting an epinephrine drug. And that, rate, that infusion rate is, uh, starts off at uh, 2 to 10 mics a minute. Yeah, so that's the first one. Any questions on the anaphylaxis? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you're saying you're going to give the fluid bolus of obstructive shock. When you think of obstructive shock, what, you, what comes to mind? Now, we've we're, been we're talking about this dilation and, and you know, tissue's not confusing because it's not getting the blood to uh, the, the organs and tissues and, and the cells because of that vasodilation. Obstructive shock is basically a blockage. Result of uh, interference with blood flow throughout the cardiovascular system. Uh, it impairs uh, diastolic filling and increases you also, you also increase right or left ventricular afterload. I just wanted to, I wanted to touch on that second shock really quick. Causes of, of uh, causes of obstructive shock is your pulmonary uh, tension pneumothorax, pulmonary embolus, pericardial tamponade, and with uh, uh, neocell tumor acute pulmonary hypertension and the art dissection. With a, with a uh, tension pneumothorax, if you think about it, what happens is, a new, what is a pneumothorax? Air in the pleural cavity. Air in the pleural cavity, one, right? What a tension pneumothorax is, is that air in the pleural cavity has increased and pushed everything up to, to the other side, resulting in uh, you know, veins getting compressed, or uh, yeah, foot vessels being compressed and limiting that blood flow. Pulmonary emboli, uh, I'm sorry, with, with, a, with a tension pneumo, you'll complain of uh, difficulty breathing, you'll see distended neck veins, you possibly feel uh, sub subcutaneous air, which is kind of cool to feel if you never fall forward. Uh, patient might be hypoxic, and I have an altered mental status. And they'll be uh, hypotensive, and because of that blocking of the, of the, of the uh, vessels, and they might be, or they might be hypovolemic. Uh, pulmonary emboli is a blockage. Is is a is, is a blockage in, in the, uh, the vessels itself, 
pa patient may complain of difficulty breathing. Uh, you'll hear diminished lung sounds on one side or the other, whatever side it's on. And then they make a complaint of pain. Pericardial tympanog uh, is what, what happened there is, is the sac that's surrounding the heart, the pericardium, uh, becomes full of fluid. Patients with complaint of difficulty breathing, they might be cyanotic. You'll see JVD, that your, your neck may be distended uh, because you're not getting good return back to your heart. Um, because of the sac filling fluid, if you listen to lung sounds, 